It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Deborah van der Meer from the University of Twente. Uh, that is going to continue on the topic. He's going to talk about impact of a boiling liquid. So, Deborah, please. So I'm going to be talking to you about uh, impact of a boiling liquid and that is work that we're doing at the University of Twente uh, with Bernardo um, uh, Palacios, with Edgar Ortega, uh, Ellis Fan and Nayon Kim in collaboration with Laurent Brosset and uh, Nicolas Couty from GTT, the company that Louis already introduced, and uh, with Rodrigo Eseta and Hannes, Hannes uh, Boogheid from Marin. So the reason that we're doing this uh, type of research is because of the energy transition where we go from traditional fossil fuels to more renewable fuels like methane and hydrogen. And uh, those renewable gaseous fuels, they are most efficiently <coughs> transported as cryogenic liquids, as you can see over here. And a cryogenic liquid is what I call a boiling liquid, a liquid that is at its boiling point in thermodynamic equilibrium with its own vapor. And as uh, Louis Dibault just very nicely introduced, uh, the industry needs to deal with sloshing, and uh, while well, sloshing is like the, the going back and forth of the liquid inside these huge tanks, and it has been shown that the container load that is experienced in these huge containers, 40 by 40 by 40 meters, is almost exclusively caused by sloshing wave impact. So <laughs> the point that I want to investigate today is how to include phase change in our understanding of liquid impact problems. And I will do so in two uh, experimental setups, the first of which at very small scale, so very different from the ones that uh, Louis has been talking about. Uh, the first that I will discuss is droplet impact. And uh, well, this is the experimental setup that we have. So we have a container that is completely isolated from its environment. We evacuate the container. We can control the temperature inside the container through the walls. And then we fill in a liquid with a low boiling point, Novex 7000, and let it evaporate. And then we have a liquid in equilibrium with its own vapor, and we do impact experiments. But I want to start with, uh, with saying why we are doing this, or, or why we are using Novex 7000 as a working fluid. Novex 7000 is a fluorocarbon, one methoxyheptafluoropropane. And uh, well, the, it has a very low boiling point, which is nice, 34 degrees Celsius. At uh, ambient uh, temperatures, it has a, a very high vapor pressure of about 59 kilopascals. It's chemically inactive, uh, non-combustible, which is very nice, of course, and it's non-conducting, so you can put all your electronics in there without any trouble. It's even better than water in that respect. So it has a rather small surface tension, five, six times as small as water, a low viscosity, one third of that of water, a liquid density of a little bit higher, 1.4 uh, uh, grams per cubic centimeter, and the latent heat also uh, a factor of three smaller than water. It's colorless and transparent. The only down uh, point is that it's very expensive. But okay, if you do droplet experiments, you don't need a lot. And so here you see a typical impact at uh, 20 degrees Celsius at a substrate that is also 20 degrees Celsius. And while well, the movie is still running, because uh, Novex 7000 is extremely wetting, and what happens is that the droplet is pinned in the process. Now, if we heat the substrate, then this is what you will typically see. Then uh, the droplet actually contracts, and uh, well, from a bottom view, you see how that looks. And what we see is that at a higher surface uh, temperature, the droplet retracts and may even start to oscillate. But what I want to concentrate on for this talk is what happens below the droplet. And to that end, we use a total internal reflection TIR setup. And uh, with that setup, we are essentially, we have total uh, reflection conditions inside a prism, a sapphire prism. And where it's not wetted, the light is reflected. Where uh, the prism becomes wetted, light is uh, uh, transmitted and you see uh, refracted and you see a dark uh, uh, a patch where you have uh, no reflection from the wetted prism. So how does that look in a typical experiment? So I brought you a little movie of this. This is at a high surface temperature and you see the, yeah, the boiling structure of the droplet as it impacts onto the surface. But 
let me see what now happens if we really look at a single droplet at a normal ambient temperature and a normal surface temperature uh, of, the, of the substrate. So this is Novex 7000 impacting in air. And what we see is, and this is the, the dark gray thing that you see in the center, that a bubble is entrapped upon impact. This is very well known. Air bubbles are entrapped beneath the droplets. Uh, this, uh, there are several references where that has been described uh, in much detail. But if we do the same experiment in Novex 7000 in vapor, then we see that there is no trace of a bubble inside the droplet. So there is this refraction, this stripe is a reflection, but you see no uh, bubble at all. Then if we take the same impact speed, but heat the substrate, so, oh yeah, sorry. So the, I forgot to say that the reason why this happens, we think, is that vapor may condensate faster than the impact speed. So if we repeat the, uh, the experiment at the higher substrate temp temperature, then we see that we start uh, entrapping a bubble again. And uh, yeah, so by heating the substrate, we can uh, get a vapor bubble back to be entrapped below the droplet. Now, so what is happening? If you have Novex 7000 or water in air, then the droplet falls down. As you see over here, air or vapor is entrapped. Air is entrapped below the droplet. It's cushioning the impact as if the droplet were falling into a pillow and uh, we get an air bubble that is entrapped. Now, if we do the same experiment in vapor, then what happens is that due to the pressure buildup below the droplet, uh, condensation is fast enough to, uh, to basically uh, get rid of your, uh, your in-between vapor uh, while you're impacting and uh, your droplet is not braked as it uh, bounces down and you get a stronger impact as what you had uh, uh, when a bubble would be entrapped. Good, if we now, uh, so substrate heating of course will counteract this condensation. If we now uh, vary the impact speed all at, uh, at, at ambient uh, uh, temperature, so with a non-heated substrate, then we see that for a very low impact speed we entrap a bubble, but if we increase the impact speed then at around 0.5, a little bit higher, 0.5 meter per second, the bubble disappears and we don't have a droplet any longer. So we can put this all into a phase diagram here you see the, the, the circle uh, symbols are where we entrap an air bubble. The crosses are, are where we don't entrap an air bubble. And the color coding gives you the lifetime of the droplet. So dark colors correspond to, uh, to a small lifetime of the droplets and uh, lighter colors to a long lifetime. Now, there is a clear transition as a function of, so we have U0 on the vertical and uh, superheat delta T on the horizontal and there is a clear transition between the two. And you also see that the farther away you are from this transition line, more or less, uh, the lifetime of the uh, entrapped vapor bubbles becomes uh, longer. Good, can we understand what is going on in this experiment? Now, we need a few ingredients in order to do so. The answer is yes, by the way. <laughs> but we need a few ingredients to do so, and the first is the, is the vapor curve. So uh, what we do, so you can, since we're living on the vapor curve, we can use Clausius Clapeyron and solve it. But the only thing that we need in this particular situation is the linearized version of it, which we can summarize that relative uh, changes in density and pressure are similar, whereas uh, relative changes in temperature are smaller by a factor beta. And beta is defined as Rs T naught over uh, L, where uh, Rs is the specific uh, uh, gas constant. Of the, of the gas that we're using, of the vapor that we're using, and L is the latent heat. Beta is usually small, so 0.01 to 0.1. Now, then the second ingredient is a one-dimensional vapor pocket model, where we assume that the vapor is always in, uh, in equilibrium, so we're always living up at the vapor curve in our bubble, and then we have uh, liquid, uh, the liquid transporting uh, heat away or, or transporting heat towards the pocket, whether we have condensation or evaporation. So the condensation heat uh, is lost through the liquid, and this is an idea that has been around for a long time. You see the references of, uh, of Placid and Prosperity down there. 
So uh, <coughs> we can summarize that in uh, an energy mass balance equation where the heat that is created when uh, vapor condensates is being transported away into the liquid. And then if we estimate the, uh, the gradient, so I should say that here we neglect the heat capacity of the vapor and volume changes into the liquid. But if we uh, estimate the temperature gradient in the liquid as just uh, the difference in temperature between the vapor and the liquid far away from the droplet divided by uh, some boundary layer, thermal boundary layer, the square root of pi times alpha L, the, uh, the thermal diffusivity in the liquid, times the amount of time that, uh, that the pressure rise in the vapor pocket exists, then uh, we can write the, uh, the mass change of the vapor bubble in the following way and express it by use of the linearized uh, clausius clapeyron relation, we can uh, express it into the vapor pressure. Now, the speed of the condensation front, we just define uh, by dividing through the density and the, uh, the surface area of the pocket. And then if we plug all those ingredients together, we get an expression of the speed of the condensation front uh, expressed in the pressure rise inside the vapor pocket. And, uh, well, we can neaten this expression a little bit up uh, in, in dimensionless groups that are a bit understandable, like... Uh, the ratio between the, the liquid density and the vapor density and the ratio of the uh, specific heat in the liquid and RS, the specific uh, gas constant. Good. Now, the third ingredient is knowing something about how a droplet entraps an air bubble below a, non -condens uh, below a, a, a droplet in a non-condensable gas case, so in air. And well, this is uh, just the arguments that are from that uh, paper over there, Bauhaus et al. And so first we have mass conservation in the gas layer, which we treat as a lubrication layer. Then uh, we have momentum conservation in that layer. And well, if we estimate the different terms, the pressure gradient as delta Pg over the typical length scale, which is this square root of the, the radius of the droplet times the, uh, the height Hd. And on the other side, we have the, uh, the, the, the viscous term, which is also uh, estimated as mu g times u g, so the speed in the gas over uh, the dimple height hd squared. And uh, while well, combining, we get an expression for the gas pressure that is generated below the droplet. And uh, well, if we just equate that with the deformation pressure that is needed to deform the liquid just above it, Hmm? then uh, by putting the two uh, equal to one another, we find uh, 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 basically a relation between the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the dimple height HD, non-dimensionalized with the radius of the droplet, as a function of the other parameters, which then gives you uh, the famous HD over R0 goes as Stokes to the minus two thirds law. Now, now we need to include uh, condensation in that picture. So we take the same pressure buildup. And then, of course, that pressure buildup in the case of a vapor will trigger condensation. So here we plug that result into uh, the condensation speed that we just uh, derived. And, uh, well, then we find the following expression where we have the, the condensation speed essentially expressed in R0 squared over HD squared. Now, what will, what, it's good to realize that at the moment that the dimple would be formed, condensation must be fast enough to prevent the pressure to build up. Then we will not entrap a, a bubble below, the, below the, 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 uh, the droplet. So if we do that, so that implies that if we now use this Stokes to the power minus two thirds law, insert it into this uh, u con over u naught, then we should get uh, a criterion on whether we entrap a bubble or not. So if we estimate the amount of time that we generate uh, 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 a boundary layer, a thermal boundary layer inside our liquid uh, like this, and take all of the uh, equations together, then we end up with this uh, a little bit nasty expression that you see over there that basically relates uh, the condensation speed to the parameters of the problem. 
And then, well, for those of you who do not really like the expression very much, we can also express it in, in dimensions numbers that have some more meaning, like the Euler number, the Stokes number, and the Peclet number uh, in the expression that you see over there. Now, if we take this expression and compute the, uh, the value of u comed over u naught for the experiment that we did, then we see that there is indeed a crossover at about uh, 0 0.5 where we go from no, from a vapor bubble entrapment to no entrapment for the higher impact speeds, more or less explaining what we see in the experiment. So we can also do boundary integral simulations, and uh, that we do by uh, doing the uh, boundary integral simulation of the droplet motion itself. We have a boundary layer, uh, sorry, a lubrication layer, compressible lubrication layer uh, in between the droplet and the substrate, where we also account for the phase change in there. That's the equation that you see down there. And then, of course, we need a closure for the, uh, for the gradient of the, uh, of the temperature inside the droplet. And if we add all up, then we see the following uh, 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 profiles over here. So for low impact speeds, we see that uh, the dimple is moving down, but the center of the dimple is moving upward. So that is when we entrap a bubble, a vapor bubble. For a 0.4 meter per second, we see more or less the same, but at 0.6 meter per second, we see that both the, the region where the dimple is and the region where you will touch the, uh, the, the substrate are moving down. By the way, the, the black line is not the bottom, but it indicates the wavelength of the light, so that's what we see with the TIR. And, well, at 0.8 meter per second, everything just moves down and there is no trace of any entrapment of, uh, of a vapor bubble. Good, so we can include the substrate temperature in this whole uh, picture by just, uh, instead of just having the condensation heat and the heat flow into the liquid, also have a term where you have the heat that comes from the substrate and that is basically uh, uh, also needs to be transported away, so it's a, a parasitic term that comes in, in on top of the condensation heat, so you can condensate less if you want. And if you do some algebra with that, then you find that, uh, that in the end you get an expression for uh, the, the superheat of the surface in terms of the velocity and the velocity rescaled with the crossover velocity uh, that we find for uh, delta T is zero. And well, we can pl plug that into the phase diagram and we get a nice, uh, uh, a nice crossover between the two. But there is a, a single fitting parameter in that. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we can uh, get it to fit anyway, but it nicely predicts the way that the boundary is supposed to be. Good, that brings me to the second setup. And the second setup is uh, similar to the first, only now we impact a disc onto the Novak 7000 liquid. Uh, in a similar way, and we measure with two pressure sensors on the disk, we measure the pressure inside the system. And what you see is if we increase the impact speed, then the pressure goes up as is uh, uh, understood, uh, as is expected. There's a rapid increase of the center pressure peak with u naught, and the edge pressure, we also measure the pressure closer to the edge. Uh, it first follows, but then lags behind a bit. And if we now measure the center pressure peak as a function of u naught, then this is what we see. So here we have rescaled with RL u naught squared, so the, the inertial pressure scale. And then we see that if we have a temperature of 24 degrees Celsius in our system, that uh, we are nicely on a horizontal line, which is what we would expect and also what we would uh, measure if we were to do the same experiment in water. And then if we decrease the temperature, then something special is going to happen because what you see is that the pressure becomes uh, larger and larger and at 11.5 degrees Celsius, we measure pressures uh, that are many times larger than the ones that you would expect uh, based on what happens in, uh, in ambient uh, conditions just with water and air. Now, what is going on? So you have much higher pressures in Novik 7000. What is going on? You can see when you look uh, at the vapor that is entrapped below the disk, 
Here you see it at 0 0.5 meters per second. And if we have a low impact speed like that, we see that not much is uh, actually happening. So we entrap a vapor pocket, which only changes little in time as the disk moves downwards. So how we make this movie is we look at a light source under an angle that is large enough to have reflection. So everywhere where you see a, a, a light is where you are, have a reflection from the feed surface and everything, everything that is dark is where you have a diffuse reflection from the wetted disk. So if we increase the impact speed, then uh, this is what we see. So we see that as the, uh, as the impact speed increases, the vapor pocket vanishes uh, uh, quicker, but still it looks uh, pretty much like, uh, like the 0 0.5 meter per second case. But if we go to 1.5 meter per second, you see that it's almost gone in an instant. And at two meter per second, it's really almost immediately gone. And so if we look at how fast the, uh, the, the spreading velocity of this wetted region is, then we find that it can be in excess of the sound speed in, uh, in liquid Novak, which is 550 meters per second. So we find really that it closes faster than the speed of sound. Now, can we also uh, model that? So yes, we, we, if we get, use the same expression for the condensation speed that we found before, and well, before the disk hits the surf surface and it traps the vapor, there's just a very small pressure rise, but after entrapment, we can use a, an adiabatic compression model, the Bagnold model, that gives you the following result that I plot over there. And I'll go a bit quick. So essentially we assume that the amount of liquid that is actually uh, set into motion by this compression is of the order of the thickness of the layer. And then uh, we, can, uh, we can just by relating the speed of the inward moving uh, front to the condensation speed with continuity, we can collect everything and plug it into the expression to find what you see written over there. And if we take that expression and look at what is heavily changing when we change the temperature, then there are uh, three quantities that heavily are depending on temperature. That's the density of the vapor, of course. If you change the temperature, you're on the vapor curve, so it changes a lot. Then the vapor pressure is, of course, almost proportional to the vapor density. Yeah, there is the temperature, but that doesn't change a lot in absolute sense. Uh, and then there is the thickness of the vapor pocket that is entrapped below the disk, which also changes, which also is proportional to the vapor density. And then if we, uh, if we look at what kind of dependence this would lead to, it would lead to something that goes as the square root of u naught cubed over rho to the power six. You know, you have the rho over there, the p over there. So this gives you a power four and that an extra two. So uh, if we then go back to the measurements and uh, use the ansatz that the maximum pressure that we measure is a function only of this uh, u in over the sound speed that we have over there, then uh, we can plot the results versus u naught cubed over rho to the sixth or simpler u naught over rho to the two. And then if we do that, we see a very nice collapse of the data. So, what about LNG and LH2 to come back to the talk of, uh, of Louis? So uh, for, we can, of course, just plug in the, 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 the different transport coefficients and other properties of LNG and H2. And then we see that the same is expected to happen there. It's only shifted to larger velocities. Hmm, this is the disk experiment uh, that I've showed as the last. So you see that in LNG and in LH2, it shifts to uh, larger values of the velocity. And the same, or something similar at least, is also seen for, uh, for the droplet impact experiments. But uh, still, they are in a region that they could be of, uh, of importance, especially if you realize that these plots have been made for, uh, for length scales of 40 millimeters and one millimeters. And in huge LNG and LH2 tanks, you have length scales that are uh, considerably larger than those. And basically that would shift all of, the, uh, all of the crossovers. I should have said that this is the region where you would expect colonization to be dominant, everything above zero. And uh, well, so you would 
shift into that regime. Good. Then there is a third experiment that I don't have talk, time to talk about, but Louis already introduced it a little bit, so if you're interested, I can give you the details. And I end with my conclusions. So during transport of cryogenic liquids, the role of phase change uh, on wave impact is the big unknown. So we perform microscopic drop and disk impact experiments such and macroscopic experiments, the wave impacts that I haven't talked about in such boiling liquids and find significant phase change effects. During impact, vapor may condensate and the cushioning effect of the sur surrounding gaseous environment disappears and in that case you can get very, very large pressures. And uh, that is uh, what I wanted to tell you and I'd be, ha I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. If there's still time. Mike? Uh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. have some time. <laughs> I'm looking for the mic. I don't know who... Here? Oh, here. Yeah, ah, yeah there it is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I see some questions. I'm going to start with Christophe. He's closer to me. And actually, you also have a question, no? You also have a question? Ah. Thank you. As you mentioned, the cushioning effect of the, the air decreased the pressure peak that you observe at dropping pack. Yeah. For when you use this lubrication uh, theory, you can you, we can predict this peak of pressure. It goes like the Stokes to the one third or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you try to see how condensation could change this maximum pressure? Or not yet. So we are looking into yeah, that, but not yet, especially not for the droplet, yeah. but for the for the disc impact, we are a little bit further in that. But we do, of course, get it from our, uh, from our uh, uh, lubrication with yeah. boundary integral simulations. Could give interesting so. prediction on, on that. Yeah. yeah. It would be good to check. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I think it was uh, Sasa was first, and then I'll, I'll continue on the other. <laughs> I'm not going to run. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Devast. The uh, uh, is it right uh, uh, that um, um, if uh, condensation is happening, actually we can forget about it, but uh, correct the impact speed, increasing it, and uh, stating that the uh, uh, velocity of the front is that is impact speed. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, but uh, actually by knowing temperature, uh, you can uh, introduce that correction to the impact speed and after that to do the calculation and estimate in the same way as there is uh, no condensation. It seems that, I mean, practical, it, at least the, for practice, it could be. I don't know. I don't know if I completely understand you, but, but yeah, you're suggesting that maybe you can do phase change as a kind of a, 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 a correction to the, to, the, yeah, uh, the, to the, the without condensation result. And I think to some extent that could be done, especially in the case that you don't have a lot uh, of condensation. But in the case that really the, you entrap a vapor pocket and then the vapor pocket very quickly collapses, you get pressures that are really that high. So for instance, in the wave experiment that, uh, that Louis Dibault was talking about, we find uh, in, in air, we find pressures of about one bar. And in, uh, under, uh, uh, under vapor conditions, we find pressures that are two orders of magnitude larger. So uh, 100 bar. So there we cannot, that, that cannot be ch changed with the correction. And also the disk impact experiments, where the pressures are a factor 10 larger than you would have uh, 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 in air conditions. Uh, yeah, th those, those cannot be treated as a correction. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in your experiments, or in, in your cases, it looks like the transition when condensation becomes important occurs at about the same sort of velocity as you would get for the onset of um, gas compression when, when your inertial pressure starts to equal the ambient pressure in the gas. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the reduction in size of the trapped gas volume, yeah. what proportion is attributable to condensation and what proportions contribute to just comp uh, compression of the actual gas because it's, the pressure increases to much the size 
the gas yeah. will then actually compress. I see what you mean. Let, let me concentrate on the droplet impact because that's, uh, well, the other one is another case. Uh, but there, indeed, because you have a lubrication layer with a build pressure buildup in there, uh, I think if we, because we also did uh, compressible lubrication and you get very similar results to, uh, so if you, you sorry, I'm, I'm not being clear enough. So we did binary integral uh, uh, simulations of the droplet with the lubrication layer be below, and you can get, make that lubrication layer either compressible or incompressible, no? And so if you have incompressible uh, lubrication layer in between, so you don't, you also get a, a, a very clear pressure buildup and uh, there are changes, but they are uh, gradual now. So, and, and this is really a change where uh, in vapor, where the, the vapor layer disappears completely. And so where, where you don't get a buildup of pressure at all below the droplet and you don't get uh, 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 any sign of, of, of a deformation of the, of, the, of the bottom of the droplet. And you would get both with and without a, a, a compressible term in your, in your lubrication layer. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Uh, thank you very much again.